Welcome to Explore, coming to you from the Tidemark Theater. My guest is Sarah Lopez Asu, the new executive director for the Campbell River Art Gallery. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. Of course. Thanks for having me. Now, you're new, so <laughs> let's find out all about Sarah. So give us a little bit of the 411 on who Sarah is. <laughs> the elevator pitch. <laughs> uh, so I am born and raised in Montreal. Oh. And uh, I met um, Sunny, my husband, um, about 15 years ago and managed to convince him to move to Montreal, uh, where we started our family, got married, all that good stuff. Okay. Um, he lasted about five years. He was a <laughs> fish out of water. Um, those Montreal winters are unforgiving. They are. Uh, so, yeah, we ended up moving back to the West Coast okay. um, about five years ago. We started off on the mainland. And then um, four years ago now, we moved to Campbell River. Um, okay. Just because Sunny and um, I only had just, we only had the one daughter at the time wanted to connect a little bit more with um, their Kwakwakiwa culture, their family, right. extended family relations, just be in their territory. And so, yeah, we made the move all the way from Montreal to Campbell River um, and been here happily for the last four years. Now, Montreal has one of the most dynamic art fields in probably all of Canada. Do you miss that? I do. I do. And, you know, the, the main thing I tell people when they ask me, um, oh, don't you miss it? Or uh, why on earth would you give that up to move to a smaller community like Campbell River? It was really just a matter of timing. You know, right. had it been five years sooner, I probably wouldn't have been ready. Right. But we were at a place in our life where, you know, we had one kid, we wanted more. I mm. wanted a dog, a yard, a <laughs> garden, all that good stuff. Um, and so those things started to weigh in the balance. And ultimately, right. um, you know, that, that kind of diversity exists everywhere. You just have to maybe work a little bit harder at getting to it when right. you are in a place like Campbell River. But there's opportunities still. Um, they may yeah. just not be um, as, uh, as close um, right. and as numerous. Right. Yeah. What's the one thing growing up in Montreal, surrounded by all of that art and music and culture, what is your takeaway? What's the one thing that has really stuck with you as a human being? Um, just that art should be accessible. Um, music, culture, it's, it's all, it all is accessible. It's in how it's often presented that creates these barriers. Right. But having lived in a place where it's just omnipresent, it's everywhere. I mean, Montreal's got one of the most incredible mural festivals, for mm -hmm. example. And so all you need to do is simply just walk down the street and you're, you're seeing incredible art, some fascinating messages, um, individuals who just are using that platform um, right. to, to share art, to share culture, to share their own experience. And so that's my biggest takeaway is is you know art can be everywhere and it should be everywhere and it should be accessible because it's got so much um, to give in terms of helping us understand the world helping us understand what's going on and our own place in it and how we can instill change or how we can participate in what's going on right. in the bigger picture right the thread of art through community you grew up with it in Montreal. How do you see that now that you're in Campbell River? It's a much different scenario here in Campbell River. We have art, but it's not the same level of accessibility. So how in Campbell River can you see us moving forward and breaking down some of those barriers? I mean, I'd love to see a concerted effort to really um, enhance our public art here. I okay. think that those are 
wonderful opportunities to really engage with people who wouldn't otherwise step foot in an art gallery because they feel intimidated and those barriers exist psychologically for them. Right. Um, once you start putting art in the public sphere, then that's where people who wouldn't necessarily choose to engage in art kind of are confronted by it in right. good ways, sometimes in challenging ways, and that's okay too. Um, so that's somewhere where I'd love to see some growth because um, it's, it's definitely an opportunity here. Um, and similarly, it's an opportunity for the rest of the North Island, right? Which we also have a mandate to, uh, to serve. Um, so, so seeing that more in the public sphere, I think, um, would definitely help increase the public's awareness of art and of the conversations that can go on surrounding art. When you had your first child, how did that shift your perspective around viewing art or producing art or engaging with art? It's funny, I, uh, I think Lily must have been about three months old when we brought her to her first art show. Um, and while having grown up in Montreal, I was always surrounded by so, so much art and culture. Um, now, as a parent, bringing this tiny little tot to these art shows and seeing her grow up essentially in a variety of different galleries and museums and spaces where um, Sunny shows his work, we, mm -hmm. we're always going as a family. And seeing how comfortable she is in those spaces, how, mm, okay. um, how she's now able to identify what she likes and she doesn't like and oh, maybe even express why. Um, how I think old that is that's she now? so important. She's now eight. Eight, okay. Um, so, so yeah, I thought that that was amazing to watch, right? Because while I had been, in, I had been exposed to it, it was never in that sort of intimacy right. of um, really truly being able to relate to it. And then on the flip side, I did work for eight years in education in at Concordia University, and oh, okay. and so many of my conversations with students, uh, Concordia's got a phenomenal fine arts faculty, okay. and so a lot of students come to Concordia for their fine arts, and right. obviously the parents, you know, would come and knock on my door or send me an email and say, well, my kid wants to do art, but, you know, maybe they can, like, do a science degree with a minor in art, because what kind of job are they going to have? Right. And, and I'm now able to encourage my own daughter, but certainly some of those students, too, to say it's possible. It's yes. completely possible to have a career in the arts. It's just you have to work at it just like you would have to work at it for a career in biology. Right. Um, so, so, yeah, so being able to offer that to our kids now, this mm -hmm. knowledge that truly art is accessible, a career in art is accessible, you just have to, you know, work at it um, and, uh, and, yeah, follow, follow that. Now, you mentioned that you uh, taught at Concordia. Um, what is your own scholastic background? What path did you follow? So I didn't teach at Concordia. I was a recruitment officer. Oh, okay. Um, so I, um, I worked with almost kind of like a guidance counselor oh, yeah. uh, for uh, prospective university students. Um, my educational background is in commerce and in urban planning. So I'm an urban planner <laughs> by training. Um, I've never worked in urban planning per se. Yeah. Um, I just kind of, yeah, forged my own path after university um, elsewhere. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> That's, that seems to be a common theme amongst sure people is. that end up in the arts. They start out with something else and they end up in a completely different uh, path, but somehow it's a little bit related because I would think that urban planning um, is, um, urban planning, we would like to see more art in the community, out and about the community. And if you had a background in urban planning, you might be able to figure out where best to put that art. Mm -hmm. and how to engage with the local planners in developing Absolutely. that plan. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, and that was brought up uh, in my interview even of just, you know, I 
I am more aware of the intricacies of working with cities because of my right. training in urban planning. A lot of urban planning and what I loved about the program is the community building aspect. And that's okay. something that I've brought in all of my, of my positions and throughout my career. Um, yeah. I've kept certainly those teachings of how to build community, how to engage community, right. because I know from the training that I received as a planner that that can have incredible ripple effects, both economically, both, mm -hmm. um, you know, culturally, yes. uh, attracting diversity. Once you have that strong community engagement, mm -hmm. um, it's limitless, really. Awesome. Yeah. Now, we're going to take a short break. Um, I just want to remind who everybody who what they're listening to. Uh, you're listening to and or watching Explore coming to you from the Tidemark Theatre. And I do say watching and listening because this is both a video television show as well as a podcast so people can download it and take it with them on their walk. We will be right back right after this short break. Welcome back to Explore. My guest today is Sarah Lopez Asu, the new executive director for the Campbell River Art Gallery. How are you settling in? Oh, you know, I'm, uh, <laughs> I think I'm getting my sea legs under me now. It's, uh, I've been there since August 1st. And, uh, you know, in, in many places, August is a quiet month in an art gallery where um, you're sort of prepping all of your September shows and programming back to school and grants. August is a busy month, so it's trial by fire. And in the middle of a global pandemic. Oh, you know, no big deal. And now apocalyptic fires, apparently. Yes. Um, so, yeah, it's, uh, it's been an interesting landscape to start a new job in, that's for sure. So let's talk about the first set of shows. So what's coming up first? Oh, it's exciting. So uh, September 24th opens um, Sugarbush Shrapnel by Olivia Wheatung. Um, so Olivia is um, a Anishinaabeg artist from the Shemong Lake region in Ontario. Okay. Um, and her work really explores a lot of concepts surrounding traditional knowledge and mm. how that knowledge is transferred through generations. Um, but then it also brings in um, the idea that through climate change um, and ecolog ecological changes, right. that knowledge transfer then becomes threatened or it, it needs to shift and adjust because the means by which that transfer was happening may not exist anymore. Okay. And so it's, uh, it's a show that really kind of encompasses um, both Indigenous knowledge but mm -hmm. also environmentalism in a way. Um, so we're super excited to be hosting that exhibit. Um, Again, it falls in line with the art gallery's mandate mm -hmm. um, to give voice to underrepresented voices. And so having okay. an artist like Olivia here is amazing. Now, will she still be able to give a talk to a select number of people? Or are you going to do a video virtual presentation? How are yeah, you going to approach so it? Yeah, so that's where our pivot had to happen. Obviously, okay. you know, travel um, yes. sort of stopped. Right. Um, and just to ensure everyone's safety and comfort as well. Um, so we've, we've moved a lot of our programming to online. And okay. so we will have um, a virtual talk, okay. uh, much like we did for our exhibit that ran through the summer. Um, so it was okay. a Zoom talk yeah. uh, where people could sort of hear the artist speak and then ask some questions. Right. Uh, we certainly have a curatorial talk that is scheduled. Some of those will still be able to happen within the gallery. Okay. We're just having to um, invite people to register so yeah. that we can cap the number of participants. But that physical touch point is still important, especially okay. when it comes to experiencing art. Right. Um, that said, we really had fun with our programming for this show. So Good. we've got... Um, 
uh, an indigenous weaver who's coming and who's going to um, teach some cedar weaving um, okay. with the hopes of doing it in Spirit Square. Yeah. Um, so that'll be nice outdoors, weather permitting, um, and with a smaller group of people. Um, right. Tying in the environmental side, we have um, Corey Cliff, who is one of the coastal watchmen for the Wewakum Nation. Okay. And uh, he's been um, involved in the estuary restoration project. And right. So, and his approach has really taken on the seven generation approach and some traditional teachings to, uh, to inform the restoration initiatives that okay. they're doing. And so he's, we outfitted him with a GoPro and he's going around and going to give us a tour um, with Excellent. his niece kind of following along and he's going to explain some of the project, um, explain some of the initiatives, talk a little bit about um, her hereditary responsibilities as an Indigenous person from this land to protect the land. Okay. Um, and so that video series is going to be made available and with it we're doing some programming for kids and families awesome. to then do on their own. Right. But go and visit the estuary and witness mm -hmm. some of these things that Corey's talking about. So that'll be really okay. exciting. Now how long does the exhibit stay up? The it one goes all the way until mid November. Okay. At which point we'll close for our annual artisan market, whatever that looks like this year. Okay. Um, but yeah, so people can come and enjoy it um, in our space until November. We'll also um, be doing a 3D tour of the exhibit, which will be available on our website. So again, serving sort of our North Island community who may not be coming down as frequently, right. but then also anyone who's uncomfortable coming into the space, right. um, you know, who's too at risk to be mm -hmm. going into public spaces, or someone who just wants to have a look at the exhibit prior to choosing to come into the space, they'll be able to tour it virtually, which is really okay. exciting. So there are some silver linings yes. to this pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, a couple of years ago, I happened to be down in San Diego, um, and I went through Balboa Park. And at Balboa Park, they have I think it's 16 individual museums, and each one focuses on a different thing. So one is aerospace, one is automotive, one is graphic design, one is photography, and one is actually the art gallery of San Diego. It's four floors, and the art is gathered from all over the world. And it's set up where it's a downloadable app, and then it takes you through all of the collections using the app and you can either do it while you're there or you can just keep the app on your phone and do a virtual tour mm -hmm. from where somewhere in the world so i'm sure that there's some local tech um hot shots that would love to take a stab at that for the art gallery <laughs> that would be amazing yes uh, send them my way um but yeah no for now i mean and that's our challenge right now is figuring out how can we really use these opportunities yes. that technology allows us um, and leverage those digital spaces to better serve our community and to get art out there since people can't necessarily come and experience it in person. Right. Yeah. Now, when you first um, arrived in August and you got in and you got to meet your team and you guys started sitting around the table to do some brainstorming, socially distanced, of course. What was that like for you, understanding who the new team was and what was already planned that you didn't have any real role in choosing that and how that's going to transition into your own vision down the road? Mm -hmm. Well, in terms of exhibit planning, um, I guess, luckily, um, we plan many years ahead of time. And so I kind of walked in with an exhibit schedule set um, with a lot of the funding already available because the exhibit schedule was set and the grants had already been written and approved. And so that okay. did make my life a little bit easier and okay. that I um, sort of just then needed to, the real brainstorming was in terms of how do we now engage with the community? Right. Um, how do we get the word out? How do we get 
you know, people coming through and actually appreciating this amazing artwork that we took so much trouble to bring here. Um, right. So that's where the fun sort of happened. And that's where I was able to leverage some of my own community connections uh, to make sure that um, we had a good array of opportunities for people to participate. Um, my own interest in community building, my own knowledge of um, child development, in which I worked for a little while. Um, to sort of see, okay, what can we develop in terms of programming? Right. So that's where I was able to have some fun with the team. Okay. Um, and then otherwise, and, and that was clear from the board too, that what they were looking for was truly some, some leadership, some leadership and some strong communications outwards as right. well. Okay. And so that's kind of what I've just been focused on and letting um, the staff who are already in place mm -hmm. thrive and excel in what they were already doing anyway. So, <laughs> yes. you know, I'm just there to kind of cheerlead them and say, yes, keep going. Um, this is amazing. Let's yeah. see how I can fluff it up. Um, so, yes, I'm the official fluffer upper uh, these days, but that's okay. Um, and really, you know, at the end of the day, I'm not a curator, and we have yeah. an incredibly qualified curator, Janelle, yes. uh, in our space. And so um, as long as I'm, you know, supporting her in what she wants to bring and what she wants to do, yeah. then, you know, my role is done. Awesome. Yeah. All right. And you have started in the middle of a global pandemic. Thankfully, the exhibits <laughs> for the next couple months were already in place, but you really had to pivot out of the gate and figure out the engagement. What was the most challenging piece for you about that? I mean, I think it's the very principle of an art gallery is to bring people in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so it's figuring out, okay, we can't bring people in. What can we do then? Um, and so, you know, one a great example is you know, especially as we now enter this new school year, yes. um, one of our most appreciated programs and one that's incredibly valuable to even just our mandate um, is to bring kids, school groups into our space. And so now, you know, in looking at what the school year is looking like, mm -hmm. it's unlikely that field trips are going to be happening, especially to closed spaces. Right. Um, so we're quickly having to think about, okay, well, what can we do to still get those kids thinking about art? Um, we, we produced an edu kit last year that unfortunately got caught up in the school closures uh, and so oh, okay. wasn't fully able to get delivered. Okay. Um, so, and that's on contemporary Indigenous art. So super interesting, super relevant and timely. Right. So we're just finding different ways to get the word out there, get the art out there. You know, we will now visit potentially. How can we also support families who are homeschooling right now? They're certainly looking for activities and opportunities. Yeah. It's incredible, right? Yeah. The amount of families that have chosen the e-learning option. And yeah. so how can we support those families? And potentially right. they would be comfortable to come within our space, provided that we've got the programming for them. Right. So it's just sort of shifting a little bit and, and keeping our eye on, on what matters, which is getting um, getting the community access to art. Um, and just, removing the barriers. And any, removing any the any barriers. barriers. Okay. Removing as many barriers as possible, whether it's through video series, whether it's through workshops held outdoors, um, right. you know, online book discussion, which we're going to do in November. So all of those things. And then, yeah, looking at groups that we may not have really looked at before, like our homeschooling um, right. community. Well, one of the things I uh, heard recently in the news, I think it was in the last 24 hours actually, um, only 70% of, of this school district of the kids have chosen to actually attend school. And that means 30% have chosen to do the e-learning. With the e-learning though, they may not be choosing to do it through the school district, they may be choosing to do it through a different distance ed. There was one family that was now going to be doing distant ed from Saskatchewan mm -hmm. because that was the only place that they could find an actual place because all of the distant ed programs are so overwhelmed and waitlisted because they didn't have the resources for all of the hundreds of kids that are now showing up. So I think your, your approach around figuring out how to engage with those distant ed kids, knowing that some of them might not even be accessible through this school district 
is going to be your biggest challenge mm -hmm. in reaching out and letting them know that you're there to provide an education and removing those boundaries to the art. Yeah, so that's where we had to sort of scratch our heads and <laughs> none of us being homeschoolers, we're like, well, there must be somewhere where they go to get their information. So Facebook and, yeah. you know, calling friends and colleagues of, yeah, how can we reach out to them and get the message through? Now, let's take a step back. If you were to sit back on a Saturday when you're at home, out in the garden, having a cup of tea, where do you hope to be a year from now? Right here, telling you what an amazing <laughs> year we've had. Uh. <laughs> and now that we're out of the pandemic, things are great. Um, yeah, I mean, I've, uh, I, this, you know, when we moved to Campbell River, I worked for Seymour Pacific and Broad Street Properties, and I was there for about four years. And that would have been one of my shortest stints. Um, prior to that, I, I, I tend to stay. Um, yes. Because part of my approach is to first listen, mm -hmm. to listen and to hold space and to give space to those who are already there. Mm -hmm. And so that's a lot of what I'm going to be doing for this first little while anyway. Yeah. I'm not coming in hoping to revolutionize or change in any major way because um, there's already some pretty great stuff. So yeah. again, you know, back to my fluffing, I'm here to just sort of fluff and ensure that the good work that is being done is getting out there. Right. Um, so I definitely see myself still there in a year, just trucking along and hopefully being, you know, a little bit more top of mind for the Campbell River and North Island community. That would be ideal. Now, in terms of exhibits, you mentioned that there's a planning quite a ways out. So how far out are the exhibits actually already booked? Uh, so we are fully booked for 2022. Oh. Yeah. So oh, we've okay. got everything set for 2021 and, um, and for the remainder of 2020, which really isn't too much. But yeah, right. 2021 is already all set. Okay. And 2022 is already mostly set, at least the, the themes and the exhibits. Some okay. of the artists we're still in conversation with. Right. Um, but uh, but okay. yeah, we're really looking forward to it. We've got some, some fantastic group shows coming. Um, we're really sort of looking at um, bringing together artists from BC mm -hmm. um, to work on common themes. Excellent. Themes surrounding care, for example. Yeah. Uh, themes surrounding Sybil Andrews, for example. Yeah. So I think Campbell Riverites will really enjoy that. Right. Um, one, of, one of our upcoming exhibits is in response to Sybil Andrews. And so we're, um, we're tapping some contemporary artists to respond to some of Sybil's work. Awesome. Um, so yeah, so I think that we've got some really exciting group exhibits coming. We've got a couple great solo exhibits that are also coming okay. with who were even already in talks with galleries from across Canada who are interested in touring it or collaborating with us. And yeah. so that's really elevating the work that we're doing here in Campbell River. That's awesome. Putting us on the map. Um, but it's also just bringing some top quality stuff to our community and to the North Excellent. Island. And I think that that's just amazing. It is. Yeah. And that is our show. Fantastic. It, it, it goes by so fast. We could actually <laughs> dig into that for a whole other show, what you've got coming. Yeah. But we'll save that for the next time. Sarah, thank you so much for coming and spending the time with us today. We really appreciate it. And we wish you all the best in the first couple of months of your job. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me. You're welcome. You've been watching and listening to Explore, coming to you from the Tidemark Theatre in the city of Campbell River. Thanks so much for joining us. We'll see you again.